everybody. Um, so for today, um, I'm hoping that we can get through the material maybe in like 30 to 35 minutes. Um, and then I will end lecture hopefully early. Um, and I will stick around if people have questions that they wanted to ask ahead of the quiz next Monday. So that's kind of the goal, um, but we'll see how long this takes us. So um, in today, we're going to wrap up our section on the cytoskeleton. And we've discussed um, thus far, as a refresher, the different cytoskeletal filaments that are found in eukaryotic cells. We have microfilaments that are made of actin, microtubules that are made of um, tubulin heterodimers, and then this large group of um, intermediate filaments that are made up of different protein subunits. And we talked about the dynamics of these filaments. And then last class, we talked about the three major classes of motor proteins that are found in eukaryotic cells. Just as a reminder, they are myosins, which are F-actin-based motors, kinesins, which are microtubule motors, and then dynein, which is also a microtubule motor. All of them use the power of ATP hydrolysis in order to exert force on their respective filaments. And they're used for various functions in the cell. We discussed how myosins um, can be used for contractility, particularly within the case of muscle cells. Right, When your muscles contract, that's a myosin-driven process. And we also talked about how these motors can carry cargo. And myosins, kinesins, and dynins can all carry cargo within the cell either vesicles or organelles that need to be trafficked from one place to another. So today we're going to talk about two, well, one behavior and one structure in particular. We're going to discuss in kind of broadest terms um, the process of cell migration. And we're also going to talk about um, protrusions that are created at the periphery of cells called cilia. And the reason why I've chosen these as kind of the two topics to wrap up this section on the cytoskeleton is that both of them are built primarily from cytoskeletal filaments. They perform, um, you know, migration is an essential function in many cell types, and cilia are also essential for many cells. And the other reason why I chose these in particular out of all the behaviors that require the cytoskeleton is that both of them involve um, integration of signaling cascades, which is what we also talked about after the midterm, right? So migration requires cells to perceive extracell extracellular signals and then orient their migrations accordingly. And cilia, as we'll see, are important signaling hubs within most cell types. So in broadest terms, uh, well, I should say even broader than this, what I'm showing you here, Cells can move in any number of ways. So primarily, there's crawling-driven behaviors and then swimming. Um, we're only going to really be discussing crawling within the context of migration. And crawling is really dependent on different substructures created out of F-actin. As I said, you know, typically a cell is going to want to migrate in a particular direction. They're not just going to be wandering aimlessly. And so they must be able to perceive cues and use those cues in order to orient which way these actin substructures are made. Cilia, in contrast, are made um, almost exclusively out of microtubules. And you can think of these as like antenna that are on the outside of the cell and that are used to perceive many signals and also to drive swimming motility. <clears throat> so cell migration really is going on all the time in our bodies. Um, it's used in development. So most of the development of your organs is driven at some level by cell migration. Cells are created and then have to move to their final locations. Here's an example. Um, you may not think of your neurons as migrating, but during development, the neurons are extending these long axons, these long projections. And when they do so, at the tip of these, at the axon is what's called the growth cone. 
And this is an actin-based structure that's literally crawling along as the axon is extending so that the neuron can find its, um, its partners to make synaptic connections. During homeostasis, or just kind of like, you know, once you've fully developed and you're just living your life, migration is still continues to be very important. So um, one example is shown here. Um, immune cells typically are migrating throughout your body. And you're actually seeing individual immune cells that are undergoing these shape changes as they're moving through a mouse brain. And you can see that here. So it's quite a dynamic process. And Defects in, um, arising from problems in cell migration are also the source of different pathologies. You know, maybe most obviously uh, metastasis in cancer, right, where cells that have overproliferated, have hyperproliferated, will begin to migrate out of their location and metastasize around um, the human body, right? So this is a case where cells that are not normally migratory become migratory, and that is affiliated then with um, disease. So almost everything that I'll be showing you about the basic process of cell migration was discovered from studies of cells migrating in 2D culture, meaning that cultured cells were grown on a dish, and then um, they're going to be crawling across the plastic or whatever substrate um, they are adhered to. One, uh, one assay that's used widely in this field is a very simple one called the scratch wound assay. So typically, cultured cells will proliferate until they become what's called confluent, which means that they fill up the surface of whatever they're on. And once they are crowded on the dish, that's confluence, they will stop proliferating and they won't really migrate. They kind of realize there's no more room for me to grow. Um, I'm just going to hang out. So in this assay, you literally just take like a pipette tip or a piece of plastic or something and scratch across, um, killing the cells you know, along the scratch of these confluent cells. And what will happen is what's shown here. So in this, which I hope you can see, this is where the scratch was made. And these cells will sense that there's free space around them and will begin to migrate into that scratched area. So the reason why people use this is because it's much easier to look at cytoskeleton in cultured cells. These cells are quite large, typically. Um, and it's easy to manipulate these cells and look for phenotypes. So for example, you could knock down the expression of some gene that you thought was important in cell migration and look to see how well the cells migrate into this scratch. So it's very easy to do, obviously very low tech. Um, and so it's been used in the field quite a bit. The downside that people are kind of coming to grips with <laughs> is that it's not really clear how well the behavior of cells in this assay translates to real like phenomenon in your body. Um, so in your body, cells can migrate actually in a whole host of other different ways. There is what's called collective cell migration, which is when whole groups of adhered cells migrate as one unit with what are called leader cells at the front end of this wave. And obviously, our bodies are 3D structures. And so typically, cells are not going to just be adhered to one surface below them and crawling across this 2D plane. Typically, they're going to have to be migrating through some sort of 3D space. And so what's being kind of discovered is that while the structures that the cells use in 2D migration do have um, analogous structures in 3D migration, cells in 3D face a whole other host of challenges. So I would say the way the field is going now, most people are trying to transition to studying cell migration in 3D to try to better recapitulate um, the in vivo processes. Okay. So here's the cytoskeletal organization of a typical you know, fibroblast or cultured cell on a 2D substrate. Migrating cells are polarized. So we talked about polarity in terms of microtubules and actin, right? So those are filaments where the two ends are distinct, right? So the filament is polarized. Uh, 
Migrating cells as a whole are polarized because they have a front and a back. So in this, um, in this view here, which is a top-down view of a cell, the front is here on the right side. That's called the leading edge of the cell. And then the back or the rear is called the trailing edge. The leading edge is going to assemble specific actin structures that are really important for pushing out the membrane. So, right, so the, as the cell is crawling forward, it has to extend its membrane out, and actin polymerization at the front is vital for that process. At the trailing edge, you have disassembly and contraction of actin networks, and that is important to then pull the rear forward as the front is extending. Right? So there's kind of the front and the back end of the cell have to coordinate so that if the front gets too far away, you know, the, back, the adhered back is going to inhibit the migration. So you have to coordinate extension with retraction at the rear. So here are the key steps in cell migration or cell locomotion. Um, one thing I should introduce, which we unfortunately won't have time to talk about in this class, maybe it's come up in some of the other classes you've taken, are that cells adhere to substrates via protein complexes called focal adhesions. Right? So cells are typically adhered to their surroundings. They're not just floating around in solution. Um, and they mediate that through transmembrane complexes called focal adhesions. Okay. So, the first step of cell migration, this crawling migration at least, is assembly of branched actin networks at the front, at the leading edge of the cell, to extend the membrane. And we'll talk about two of these structures, lamellipodia and philopodia. So once it's extended the membrane, it has to then adhere that extended membrane to the substrate and anchor it. right? And once it's been anchored, all of the cellular contents have to then be moved forward. And that's all mediated, essentially, by the cytoskeleton internally. And then finally, as I just referred to, the trailing edge is going to have to remove its old focal adhesions and pull the membrane back to kind of bring the cell back to its typical size. So this is. It looks like individual steps, but in a typical cell that's migrating in a dish, they're all happening at the same time. As I mentioned, there are distinct populations or dis distinct structures built by F-actin that are absolutely required for cell migration, at least within this 2D context. Okay, so the three to know about are lamellipodia, so lamellipodia are at the leading edge of these migrating cells. It looks like a large ruffled extension of the membrane in front. And this is built by that actin nucleator we talked about, the ARP23 complex. So remember from our discussion about the introduction to the cytoskeleton that ARP23 nucleates branched actin networks. So at this leading edge, you have this really dense branched um, actin mesh that is pushing the membrane forward. This is also a case where there is treadmilling. So we talked about how actin undergoes this treadmilling behavior where um, subunits that are added to the plus end balance out with the subunits that are being removed at the minus end. So at the front, you have these branched actin filaments that are constantly treadmilling to propel movement forward. In addition to this really quite large, um, yeah, ruffled membrane, some cells also use kind of long, thinner protrusions to migrate, and these are called philopodia. So in contrast to lamellipodia, which are branched actin networks, philopodia are made of long, stri straight filaments that are elongated by formin, which is one of those nucleators we talked about a couple lectures ago. Just like lamellipodia, these extensions via philopodia are important for pushing the membrane forward, but they do it in a much more localized way. And then along the length of this migrating cell are these long bundles of straight actin filaments. These are called stress fibers. 
These are important because these focal adhesions that I mentioned, the protein complexes that allow the cell to adhere to the substrate, are tethered to these long bundles. And these bundles are contractile, meaning they have that myosin-2 motor in them. And that allows the cell to actually um, use the attachments on the substrate to pull itself forward, right? So they have to attach, but then by linking those attachments to contractile actin networks within the cell, they can actually use that to physically pull themselves um, along. So these are the three main ones that just at a very basic descriptive level um, I want you to walk away with that are used in many migrating 2D cells just for completion's sake. Um, there are many, well not many, there's several other types of actin-based structures that are used within specific cell contexts for migration. Um, once again, like everything we've been talking about thus far in the class, cell type really matters. Um, and so these are the ones that are used in most cell types, at least most animal cell types, um, but there are other ones that are created. So to link this then to, you know, those are the structures that are used to actually um, facilitate migration. How do cells know which direction to migrate towards? So cells can perceive different types of cues from the environment and use that to orient their migrations. One kind of canonical or dominant way this works is through a process called chemotaxis. And chemotaxis means that cells are perceiving an extracellular cue and then either are attracted or repelled by that cue. So what you're seeing here is um, these kind of amoeboid cells. This is um, a specific cell called uh, dictostelium cell. And what's kind of out of focus here is a pipette tip. And in this experiment, they're dispensing cyclic AMP out into the media. And you can see that dictostelium uses cyclic AMP as an attractive cue. So the cells perceive that soluble signal and then migrate towards it. And this happens in your body, so cells have to know how to orient, and so they're capable of using those receptors that we talked about, GPCRs, receptor tyrosine kinases, cytokine receptors. They use those to figure out, okay, is that cue coming from my left side or my right side? And then they will reorient their migration accordingly. So the two main things that need to happen is that the signal has to be perceived by the cell, and then they have to create those actin assemblies in the right place relative to that cue. So in order to do that, cells use um, a specific class of GTPases. You know, these GTPases come up again and again within the context of cell biology. And these are called collectively Rho GTPases. Rho stands for RAS homologous. So remember RAS, which we talked about within the context of MAP kinase signal transduction, as a GTPase um, whose activity regulates downstream signal cascades. Rho GTPases are similarly found in an inactive GDP bound form and an active GTP bound form. And these extracellular cues via receptors can activate Rho at the membrane in order to trigger reassembly or disassembly of actin. These pathways are, are you know, in reality quite complicated, so we're not going to go into detail about them. But what I want you to know is that there's three main Rho proteins that are re involved in cell migration. Rho, RAC, and CDC42. So if you go into cell biology, these are really the most famous rows, I would say, and you'll see them many, many times in relation to cell migration, but in relation to other processes within the cell. They're used quite for a number of things. And in all of these cases, signals via transmembrane receptors will activate Rho GEFs which will then activate 
by exchanging GDP for GDP on these different rho proteins, rho, RAC, or CDC42. And kind of interestingly, each of these is used to build a specific substructure. And the way we know this is that if you take a cultured cell and you express a hyperactive form of any one of these individually, the cell will create one main type of actin um, filament assembly. So you can see here, when you overexpress an active form of the rho GTPase, the cell will make a ton of stress fibers. If you overexpress RAC, the cell will basically make one huge ruffled lamellipodia around its entire periphery. And if you overexpress CDC42, the cell will make tons and tons of filipodia. So experiments like this tell us that each of these rows is responsible for regulating um, assembly of one type of um, actin structure. And <clears throat> you know, this is just meant to give you a flavor of how this works so that you become familiar a little bit with cell migration. But as I mentioned earlier, the assembly of actin at the front is coordinated with disassembly at the rear. So in reality, these um, rho GTPases actually kind of signal to one another in space in order to ensure that the ones required for lamellipodia and filipodia um, creation are confined to the front of the cell, whereas, um, for example, rho, which is required for contraction of these filaments at the rear, is maintained only at the rear. So what I want you to get, you know, cell migration is a, is a huge field in cell biology. Hundreds of labs around the world study this process. And, um, you know, we talked about it for 15 minutes, but, <laughs> but what I want you to take away from this, just as kind of the core concepts, related to what we've talked about since the midterm, is that this is a complex behavior that's driven by um, F-actin assembly and disassembly within specific sites in the cell. And that cells are able to perceive extracellular cues via chemotaxis and use that in order to orient where those structures are made. So this then requires the signaling cascades we talked about, it requires actin dynamics, and it also requires motor activity, particularly at the rear, which is retracting, and that's a myosin-driven process. Are there any questions here about cell migration I can answer before kind of switching gears and talking very briefly about cilia? No. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So now we'll talk about this other cytoskeleton-driven process, which is cilia, well, a structure, which is cilia. There are two types of cilia that are found in different cells. Okay? There are what are called non-motile cilia. Um, cilium is the singular of cilia. Okay. So non-motile cilia, sometimes called primary cilia. Most of the cells in our bodies, or in most animals, um, have cilia, have these primary cilia, and each cell typically has one. So as I said, you can think about this like an extension or an antenna out of the plasma membrane, and what you're seeing here is a sheet of cells. You're looking top down on a sheet of cells. Each cell is um, outlined by its plasma membrane, shown in red, and the cilia are these little green antenna that are kind of protruding out. And as we'll see, these are really an important um, place where cells integrate signaling for different downstream functions. The other make, main class of cilia, which are something that you maybe have heard about before, are motile cilia. And these are used to really move fluid in the extracellular space. You know, they're used for motility. So this is a very slowed down video of a single-celled algae called Chlamydomonas. It has two cilia which you can see here, these two little antennas, and it's beating them in order to swim around in like pond water or something, for example. Um, so motile cilia can be used for cell movement. They're also used to move fluid, for example, um, in our 
trachea, the cells that line our trachea are multiciliated, so they have many of these motile cilia that are beating at the surface of the cell, and that's important for moving uh, mucus out of your airways. Okay? So, um, you know, the punchline is in both of these contexts, movement of this antenna, coordinated beating of the antenna, um, is required for you know, moving fluid either for migration or for different physiological processes. Now maybe underscoring the importance of cilia in our cells, there's a whole class of human disorders that are called ciliopathies that arise from mutations in genes that regulate ciliary function. So I pulled this from a recent review talking about ciliopathies. And what this is meant to show is that in these different colors um, are the type of cilia that's affected. And you, so you can see that disorders arise from both defects in motile cilia and also non-motile cilia. And it affects all, almost all of your body systems or body organs, right? And that's because cilia are found in almost all the cells of your body. So one example here, this um, primary ciliary disc kinesia, this is a defect um, that's caused by mutations that impact motile cilia function. So without motile cilia, these patients have problems in left-right asymmetry. So we all know our heart is on our left side, so we're actually asymmetric um, beings. And actually, left-right asymmetry is caused by beating cilia, very interestingly. So if you don't have proper functioning motile cilia, you have problems in left-right asymmetry during development. These patients also get many lung infections um, because they can't clear the mucus out of their airways. And also they have male infertility because sperm use motile cilia in order to move. Right? So you can just see that defects in any one particular gene can affect a whole host of um, your systems, your body systems. So this is the basic structure of a cilium. It's a protrusion, as I said, at the plasma membrane, and it's built from parallel microtubules. At the base of the cilium is what's called the basal body. This is a modified centriole. So we talked about centrosomes in the microtubule lecture as being important organizing centers for microtubules in many cells. And these centrosomes are made up of two centrioles. In cells that form cilium, the centrioles actually move to the surface of the cell and dock at the plasma membrane. And then um, two microtubules out of each of these triplets in the centriole will extend up to create this projection. This basic structure around the kind of the core of the cilium is called the axoneme. And we'll talk a little bit more about the organization of the axoneme. And all cilium also have in common, so all cilium have basal bodies, all cilium have the axoneme, and all cilium also use what are called IFT trains or rafts. And these are um, groups of motor proteins that basically move things up and down the cilium from the base to the tip and the tip back down to the base. So let's go into a little more detail here. If you go on the right side of this schematic here, you can see the axoneme of a non-motile and of a motile cilium. Both of them have nine radially symmetrical microtubule doublets. Okay, around the periphery. The difference between a non-motile and a motile cilia is that the motile one, in addition to those nine doublets, has a, uh, two singlets in its core. These singlets are important for providing rigidity to this, mem to this cilium. So motile cilia have to be beating, and they need some sort of structural rigidity in order to do that. And these siglets provide that kind of core that um, allows it to be flexible, but 
uh, well, flexible and rigid at the same time, I guess. In addition to that central pair of singlet microtubules, motile cilia have the microtubule motor dynein arranged all along these microtubules, as is shown here. So if you look at any of these two doublets in a motile cilia, there is going to be this dynein motor bound to them. And what is happening when cilia beat is that the dynein's, which are minus n directed motors, are coordinately pulling and sliding the microtubules relative to each other. And so as dynein's are activated kind of in a ring form around the cilia, you know, some dynein's are contracting on one side and that causes bending of the cilium. And so coordination of this all around the ring is what allows the cilia to beat um, in fluid. So once again, this is a quite complex process um, that requires coordination of many hundreds to thousands of motor proteins. But what I want to just kind of call your attention to is dynein, that motor we talked about a couple of lectures ago, is important not just in transport, but also important for regulating beating of cilia. And the last, well, actually, there's two more pieces of information I want you to know about cilia. The first is that in order to move things from um, one end of the cilia to the other, there are specific motor proteins that are found in cilia that traffic things, um, either in the anterograde direction or in the retrograde direction. So anterograde is from the base to the tip, and retrograde then is back to the cell, so back from the tip to the base. This intraflagellar transport is found in both motile and non-motile cilia, and it's really important because, um, as I say up here in the first point, there are no ribosomes in cilia. There's not enough space for ribosomes. So any proteins that need to go into cilia, and there are about 600 to 1,000 of them that need to make their way into the structure, all of them have to be moved by these IFT trains. Um, the motor that's responsible for the anterograde trafficking is kinesin 2, so it's a plus N directed motor. The plus Ns are at the ciliary tip. And then our good friend dynein, the minus N directed motor, is responsible for bringing traffic back down from the tip. So the last thing I just want to highlight, um, almost like embarrassingly superficial, superficially is the fact that this structure is a really important signaling center. This was kind of first worked out and is most well, well worked out for a signaling cascade um, called hedgehog signaling, which if you've taken developmental biology courses, I'm sure they would have covered um, in that context. Hedgehog signaling is required for many developmental processes. Uh, most notably maybe neurodevelopment. Um, but it was first identified in a screen in the 80s looking for Drosophila mutants, so fruit fly mutants that had developmental pattern defects. And this mutant, which is shown here, so this is a Drosophila larva, and in mutants in the hedgehog signaling pass cascade, you get larvae that look like this which they said looked kind of like a hedgehog. So that's where the name comes from. And as you can see, I'm not going to ask that you know um, how this signaling cascade works. But the point that I do want you to know is that there are specific rep receptors that are found within cilia that are localized to cilia. And um, activation of hedgehog signaling requires movement of these receptors in and out of cilia in order to cause changes in gene expression. Right? So without cilia, you really cannot activate hedgehog signaling correctly. And the point that I want to underscore then is that this little protrusion does play really important roles um, within most cells. Okay. So what I want to take away, you should take away from this very brief description of cilia is that there are two types of cilia found in cells. They're both made from microtubules, but some of them are used to move fluid. These are the motile cilia, 
and the non-motile cilia's functions are primarily signaling. And I think that this um, schematic does a nice job summarizing how the organization of the axoneme in motile cilia is different than non-motile cilia. And just to reiterate this point, non-motile cilia have this, these nine doublet microtubules around their periphery, whereas motile cilia have the same nine microtubule doublets, but also two microtubule singlets in the center. So, you know, within the context of cell biology, I just wanted to highlight today in this kind of short lecture um, ways that the cytoskeleton can be used to build certain um, cellular features that are used either for cell migration, for cilia. Obviously, this is not like the extent of what the cytoskeleton is required for, but just maybe a, a preview if this is something you're interested in about how um, cytoskeletal regulation can drive quite distinct behaviors within the cell and how they're really essential for multiple processes. And so with that, I of course have this slide for you to look at um, again. I do have two additional slides if you keep scrolling down in the PDF. The quiz is in class on Monday. It will follow very closely the um, the format that you saw in quiz one and in the midterm. And we really covered two main kind of themes since the midterm. I should say once again, the quiz will only cover the material from lecture 13, which was the class after the midterm, up through today. Okay. Um, so within this, this is not meant to be exhaustive, but just to kind of orient you to the themes we talked about. Uh, we talked about how signaling cascades are organized. That's an important thing to know about. We talked about how receptors are activated by extracellular signals. We talked about the key second messengers found in particular signaling cascades, which is also a great thing to know about. Um, and we also talked about some of the downstream uh, consequences of signal cascade activation. Um, and then within the cytoskeleton, you know, we discussed the three main classes and how their dynamics are regulated, how they're polymerized from subunits. Those are great things to know about. Um, we talked about the different types of motor proteins and the specific mechanisms that they use to walk along their respective filaments, which are, is a great thing to review as well. And then today we talked about in basic terms um, kind of in big picture terms, how cell migration is regulated and how cilia are constructed. So I provide these to you. I also, for those of you who may not have seen, um, I did put up on Canvas one of those like main topic sheets um, that is a little bit more extensive than each of these and goes for each lecture into like what were the six or seven main points from a given lecture. So with that, there's about 12 minutes left, 10 minutes left, and I will stick around if people have questions um, that they want answered before the quiz next Monday. So please be here. You have to be here on Monday to take the quiz. There's going to be no makeups. Okay, thank you.